Welcome to Echoes of Swing. My name is April DeShields, and we're sitting today with Alan Vache, clarinetist, of whom, uh, without probably realizing, you may very well have heard many times, either on the radio or in different uh, movie soundtracks or television at some point or another. So welcome, Alan. Thank you very much for sitting with us today. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, it's, I was mentioning to you just a moment ago, it's kind of hard to interview a friend you've known a long time because you uh, have the tendency to either go into nicknames or re refer to old stories that both of us know that everybody else is in the dark with. So I will do my best not to do that. <laughs> But I know that um, one of the things that I appreciated most, I guess, as um, a young young kid, first really meeting you for the first time was the fact how patient and how um, welcoming you were for a kid that was interested in this music who, uh, at me, Oh, just extremely interested. Once I'm interested in something, then I, I do a deep dive. And I was in a perpetual deep dive that I've never gotten out of as far as this music is concerned. And yourself and Tom Saunders and Wild Bill and Chuck Hedges and those guys, Russ Phillips, have always been so kind and patient. That's why really I stuck with it as much as I did, because I did not feel like it was, eh, kid, get out of my face. You're, <laughs> you're irritating. I'm trying to rest and relax. So thank you for that, but I know that it is important to you as well as all the other folks that I had mentioned that people that are showing interest, especially at a young age, get encouraged. And why do you why do you feel so strongly about that? Well, because it's the only way the music will uh, continue and perpetuate mm -hmm. is that uh, the fan base of uh, this kind of music uh, has been for several years and seems to continue be to be. Um, older people, people who grew up during World War II or before that, you know, and yeah. so the fan base is basically dying off. Yeah. And when you see a, a, a young person like yourself who's interested in this music, you want to perpetuate that because yeah. you'd like to see more young people interested in this music because that's the only way it's going to continue. Mm -hmm. This is why I will try to encourage as many young musicians as possible who are interested mm -hmm. in playing this kind of music because I'm not going to be around forever. Mm -hmm. Some of the people that you just talked about, Chuck Hedges and Tom Saunders, they're gone. Mm -hmm. You know, we just lost some some great musicians in the last couple of years, but Bucky yeah. Pizzarelli, Jim Cullum, John Sheridan just a week or so ago, some of my uh, dear friends that I've known for about 50 years or more. Right. And uh, none of us are going to be around forever mm -hmm. so it's important that we have uh, young musicians coming up and younger people coming to listen to the music mm -hmm. and, and supporting it so you know uh, and you know as a, when i was a young kid uh, back in the uh, dark ages of the <laughs> 1960s and 1970s i there were several musicians of the time that were not that nice to me. Yeah. Or not nice to my brother Warren, who was also coming up at that time. And uh, they looked upon us as competition. Yeah, you know? that's so sad. And uh, that, that that was unfortunate. However, not all of them were like that. I, I got to know some really great musicians at that time. People like Kenny Deverne and Pee Wee Irwin and Can't, other names escape me at the moment, but some yeah. really great, you know, and uh, Bob Haggard, you know, these people, and they he were all Bob great. Wilbur before too. Bob, he was... Yeah, Bob Wilbur, sure, yeah, and uh, um, they were also very encouraging. I mean, Bobby Rosengarten, trying to think of Ralph Sutton, all these guys were uh, encouraged younger guys like myself and my and and Warren and other guys, you know, that we were working with Randy Reinhardt, another one. We mm -hmm. all kind of came up together out of the New Jersey area, you know. So, um, but uh, I just feel like I'm paying it forward kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, this I want to do the same thing for, for now that I'm an old guy, <laughs> you know. 
Watch it. Awesome. We're not too far yeah. apart, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm 68 this year, honey. Uh, I'm I'm seem to be gaining ground every year. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know that you had a supportive parents because uh i know at some point or another over the years you and i had talked about that if it had been something where you said mom dad i want to be a musician a lot of parents are like oh oh no 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 yeah. but yours weren't how were they well, to be yeah, no, my father was a musician my father was a bassist mm -hmm. and an author he wrote several books about jazz uh, players he wrote a book about Pee Wee Irwin. wrote one about claude hopkins uh, wrote another one about songwriters, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, my mother, who was not a musician, she was the one who was the disciplinarian, and she was the one who forced us to practice as kids. You know? <laughs> but uh, they, they were all, uh, you know, dad played with several different bands. Uh, one that was uh, very popular in New Jersey back in the 60s, a drummer named Chuck Slate, and he had a band called the Chuck Slate's traditional jazz band, and, my, mm -hmm. and uh, my dad played with Chuck for several years, and uh, so anyway, they were very, they, you know, my father told me once that he wanted to always wish that he had been able to make a living as a musician, yeah. but yeah. he had a family, and he didn't think he was, he was going to be able to uh, support his family, so he ended up getting a day job, but still worked gigs on the weekends you know yeah so, well in this music especially as nowadays it seems that there seems to be fewer and fewer people that are able to be able to support themselves as a full-time musician just because of either public tastes and opinions or the lack of venues or the lack of funds that go toward either music education or just jazz in general um just a million and one different things i know your dad uh when i worked at kazu we had a, a web link, which I hated initially because, as you know, I was working two and three jobs at the time. So I would work Friday night real late, get a couple hours sleep, get up at four in the morning on Saturday. If I accidentally slept in, then I would be going to the station in my PJs. And a live web feed really cramped that idea. Um, but your dad would be, uh, listen sometimes to the web link, not every Saturday, but sometimes. Yeah. And he would send a, a follow-up email on things and different stories about things. And I always thought that was kind of him to take the time to pay attention to do that. And I thought, well, if he was like that with me, who he doesn't even know, I can only imagine kind of the help that you and Warren got. Just if you wanted to know something about music, you know, he'd help you get it if he didn't you know. know. We did and we didn't, you know. My, yeah. our, dad was, our dad was very opinionated, you know. Yeah. Uh, certain things. <laughs> you always knew where he stood, though. <laughs> you know. He was <laughs> Warren would come home with a new CD, and my my old man would put on and like play three seconds of each tune and turn around to him and say to him, "Why do you record that shit?" You know. <laughs> but I, I he probably listened to it over and over and over again once Warren was gone because I do remember he, that he would, do, he would do things like play the two of us against him. You know, I would yeah. I'd come out with a new record and he'd say, if you go to Warren and say, hear your brother's new record, it's really great. <laughs> well, and just in emails to me, he was always bragging on both of you. And I just thought it was so funny that he, he what I would hear from you, what he was doing between you and Warren. Yeah, he would do and that. And then to me, he that. was just nonstop complimentary about yeah. both of you. I just thought that was kind of hilarious. Yeah, well, that's the way he was, you know. He yeah. Was, you know. You know, well, know. I, my parent, both my parents grew up during the Depression, you know, so, and, uh, you know, my father was uh, in World War II, so uh, as a, he was actually older, he was drafted when he was 28, which was kind of late. But, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, so it's a different, it's a different generation of stuff that we, didn't, we don't, we will never really understand what those, what those people, how they lived and how they, how yeah. they survived how they survived through that horrible time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I know speaking about sort of the audience is dying out at some point or another, either in an interview or you and I have talked about it. I don't know. I know it's something that Wild Bill used to mention fairly frequently was the reactions to this kind of music across broad age ranges is vastly different in this country than it is 
in various different, especially oh, European very countries. Much so, very much so, you know, because I've been all over the all, all over the world. Um, you know, I did several tours of Europe uh, back in 2009 when I was doing, excuse me, when I was doing the uh, Goodman Centennial thing. Uh, I took a big band down to Brazil for about two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. And one of the at one of the concerts, uh, there were over five or six thousand people there, which oh, is wow. something for a jazz concert. Yeah, unheard of here. Right. You know, I mean, if you get if you do a jazz concert, you got three or four hundred people. You you're doing pretty well. You know. Yeah. Right. And then six thousand. Goodness. Yeah. No. Kidding. I remember you setting up to do that one, but I wasn't. What I didn't realize until I saw some post you did on Facebook. I think at some point was that that was something arranged by the Goodman estate. So how did that come together? Actually, uh, uh, I was asked by the Goodman estate to be one of the clarinetists who did the uh, centennial tributes. Ah, okay. So um, I did a couple of them. We did, uh, uh, I did the thing in Brazil with a big band, but then I went to, uh, to Russia mm -hmm. and did a short tour with just a quartet like a Goodman style quartet with a Russian pianist and a Russian vibraphonist and a German drummer. drummer. We huh. were fighting World War II all over again. <laughs> I was just going to say, it's kind of like the good neighbor policy and, yeah. and much later. <laughs> and yet, then from there, I went to Germany with the same drummer. And uh -huh. they, they put a tour together and we had a, a, a German rhythm section, a Swiss piano player and a Swiss a uh, bass player and Bernard again, who was a wonderful drummer, good friends with Chuck, uh -huh. Bernard Flager, very good. Oh yeah. Drummer. Yeah. Yes. Very good. So, and um, yeah, he came to uh, Chuck's Memorial. You were there. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And then we had a, a, a John Cucuzzi, Howard Oldman and myself. So mm -hmm. it was like a Goodman sextet. And we did a, like a, 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 a three week tour of Germany and Switzerland. How neat. At that time. For the so I did the a lot of things, you know, and the Goodman Estate had asked me to uh, to do that, but I wasn't the only one. There were other guys. Poplowski did some. I'm trying to think who else. Did. I think Dave Bennett did a couple. You know, uh -huh. all, this was all 2009 because it was one right this anniversary of Benny's death, Benny's birth, rather. Yeah. Well, and I know that Benny, like yourself, had classical training. Although I know that you uh, have said repeatedly that you didn't specific, you didn't build up a repertoire maybe the same way that Benny had, but you you certainly had that classical training. And one thing that I did find interesting at some point that you and I had talked about was how much uh, certain composers in classical music actually sound so much like jazz. One that I was, I had talked to you about was I just heard one of Tchaikovsky's uh, piano concertos that I think was written maybe around 1920. Uh, I'll correct myself in the description of the video at some point because I didn't think to do that. But Tchaikovsky. <clears throat> well, it, there was one where there was some, some references in there to me that sounded an awful lot like Rhapsody in Blue. It just kind of just, you just go, yeah, wow, you stole. It could have been Tchaikovsky, honey, because he would be dead by 1920. <laughs> Did I say Tchaikovsky? Oh, my yeah, God. Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff, yeah. Rachmaninoff. <laughs> Good Lord, April. Have more coffee. Yeah, Rachmaninoff. <laughs> it was one of his later piano concertos. Yeah. And you and I started talking about that. And we both started talking about how he really kind of had to have heard some of Gershwin at that point or another because he just oh, made I'm so sure many he references. Yeah. He was, a, he was a, actually, he was a fan of Gershwin. And, uh, well, you know, the, the composers of the rubber turn, turn of the century, um, many of them were influenced by jazz players. Yeah. As jazz players were influenced by the composers. I mean, right. Heiderbeck loved Ravel, you know, he was, and when I was in college, I studied with a guy named Dave Dworkin, mm -hmm. who uh, was uh, with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. Right. So uh, that's the, that's that was my classical training, but, Dave was a good guy, and he knew that I wasn't interested in being a, a classical player. Yeah. Yeah. So he steered me towards music that he thought would be more apropos for me. Mm -hmm. So, like when I did my senior recital, I played a, a Ravel a Ravel piece, 
and uh, a, a sonata by Alec Wilder. Right. And some more uh, modern uh, jazz oriented classical pieces, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know that um, one of the most important things that both you and Chuck told me, which I've, you told me Kenny Deverne had taught you, was basically the best way to learn how to develop your own style is to listen to everyone else's <laughs> that came before yeah, you. Right. And you and Chuck specifically were very pro Lester Young. I hadn't listened yeah. to much of him until I was about eight or nine. And then both of you just, I think we were in a musician's lounge somewhere or another and <laughs> both of you went off for a good half hour <laughs> on Lester Young. So okay, my first yeah. trip to the library when I got home from that festival was to go and pile up as much Lester Young as possible. But uh, I know that you said that Kenny, you have said before that Kenny really helped you in the higher register and that's something that oh, really yeah. you excel so several, well at. Kenny taught me several different fingerings in the upper register that worked much better than what they give you in the, uh, in the fingering. Yeah and so forth, you know, that he had developed, a lot of them he had developed himself because right. he started on the Albert system and then switched the band mm -hmm. so he could play both systems. Oh, I didn't so, realize he was fully, he could switch between the two. Yeah, didn't Barney uh, Begard do that too or was he mostly Albert? I don't really know. Oh. I, don't know. I think as far as I know, he played Albert system. Oh. But a lot of all, all the early New Orleans guys, they all played Albert system. Yeah. And if you go to Europe, they tell you it's the German system. Oh, good to know. <laughs> you know, the German kind of place. I played German system, which I always thought was kind of strange because the Albert system was invented by Carl Albert. It was French. It was French. Yeah. Bam was a German. German, yeah. So it's very confusing. <laughs> so I don't understand that, but you know. <laughs> um, but that's what they, they, they are all these, all the, the trad guys over in, in Germany, they all play, and, and, and Austria and so forth, they all play the Albert system. They call it the German system. Yeah. But, you know, I guess it's German to them. Anyway, uh, but Kenny uh, could play, started out on Albert and then he switched over to Bing. And then, so he did, he took some of the out fingerings that he had on Albert and used them on the Bing, especially in the Albert register. Yeah. Now, practically for me, I've been able to play up to a double high C and not much higher than that, sometimes a C sharp. He tried to show me he could play an F above that. Oh. Which was. I don't think I ever heard him do that. Yeah. How neat. Uh, I know that you taught me some of the fingerings and certainly my life improved a great deal in high school band after that. <laughs> 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 but I was nowhere near you, obviously. But yeah, you. Well, you, you know, as you get older, you try, you, yeah. it's not harder to do. I, 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 my upper register is not what it used to be anymore. Of course. Also, the fact that I'm not playing as much as I used to be, you know. Yeah. But right now, nobody is, you know. Yeah. Well, I I was kind of, I should say, not surprised. I was happy to hear that you've been making use of your time during COVID and actually doing some arrangements. I did a whole bunch of arrangements. Right? Mm hmm Because I know Vanessa works with a, which, is it a chamber group or? No, it's, it's a, with the Woodwind Quintet. Uh-huh. Which is... Uh, Clarinet, oboe, bassoon, flute, and French horn. Mm -hmm. What the French horn has to do with a woodwind quintet, I never have figured out, but that's the instrumentation of a woodwind quintet. Uh -huh. So I've, I did a lot of arrangements for that group. The group is no longer no longer really exists anymore. Uh -huh. The French horn player went moved to Texas and uh, became a lawyer, and the bassoon player became a pharmacist, and the oboe player passed away, so... It's it's been a little strange, but I still have been writing this stuff, and I'm I'm hoping to publish some of them. For instance, I've written about twenty five uh, transcriptions of Joplin rags. Really, for woodwind quintet. Yeah. Oh, that would be pretty cool. They work. They work very well for the woodwind quintet. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that before, but that would actually sound really nice. Yeah. And I know that uh, it's probably of help that yourself and Vanessa can be able to keep each other busy by practicing together. And that would be kind of nice too. Yeah. Well, one of the things we did, I wrote a, uh, I arranged a uh, clarinet duet book. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been playing these, um, a lot of standard tunes and so forth. You know, we've got 25 different tunes that I wrote. So we, we get to we get together once every couple of weeks and we play some, 
some of these duets, you know. Yeah. You know. Well, I'll put a link on the description of this as well, so some people can Except see. I, I found out. I tried to get it published at one point. The guy told me he said, that, he said, if 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 they're uh, standard tunes, we can't publish them. He said we can't publish anything that was written uh, after 1925 because of the the uh, copyright copyright on it. Yeah. Oh. Well, so that's all these, unhelpful. All these tunes, you know, I, I wrote like uh, out of nowhere and cheek to cheek and some tunes like that and he, those they're all copyrighted and, and, and uh, so I can't use them unless they have to pay a fee and yeah. the publisher doesn't want to pay the fee. You know, so. Well that seems a bit short-sighted but actually clarinet wasn't even your first instrument and I know that you had said that you had started with piano at your father's insistence. Yeah both my brother and I did yeah. Which is so cool because really I mean, that's perfect because you get music theory while you're getting <laughs> learning yeah. an instrument. So, yeah, I mean, it's perfect. That's, that's why that's why my father had both of us do it. Mm -hmm. We learned more about music at first. And, but then, now, when I was in third grade, they started a new program that they were offering uh, instrumental music to third graders, which they didn't usually do. They, did, they usually started with fourth graders. And... Uh, and uh, and but they only offered two instruments, trumpet and violin. Oh. So I decided I wanted to play the trumpet. So my parents spent the money to rent the trumpet for me for three months. Uh huh. And after about a couple of weeks, it sat in the corner. <laughs> my father, my father got a friend of his, a guy by the name of Jim Fitzpatrick. Who was a great trumpet player? Played with the Hal Kemp band for several years. Oh, neat! And uh, as and he did trumpet lessons, and uh, so he Warren started studying with Jim Fitzpatrick. So I always said that I'm sort of inadvertently responsible. responsible for my brother's career, you know. And I <laughs> think he still blames me for it. Oh uh, well, you know, you've, you've got to keep up that rivalry with Dad gone, you know. <laughs> However, when I was in when I was uh, by the uh, in fifth grade, I wanted to start playing an instrument again. And I was told I wanted to play the saxophone. Mm -hmm. And my parents were very leery because of the fact that mm -hmm. the failed think, trumpet uh, experience. They rented the trumpet and nothing happened from it, you know. <laughs> so my father said, I don't think so, you know. But then in fact, they found out that <clears throat> I couldn't just play the saxophone. I had to play the clarinet first. Yeah. Harder so instrument. He so. liked that. Yeah. So he said, okay. He says, we'll rent you a clarinet. You just start on the clarinet. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started playing the clarinet. And I didn't start playing saxophone until I was in junior high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
world of charms A place to nestle when I am lonely That cozy, comfy chair Oh, what a happy pair I confess, happiness seems to bless my little honey I love her more each day When years have passed away You'll find my love was true to you only And when the world goes wrong I know that I belong back in 